All right, so, uh, you know, I went back and forth on what I was going to teach, and then the Holy Ghost made up my mind for me. Uh, you know, you want to go, I want to talk about immortality and all this other stuff. And he's like, nope, you're going to get peeps delivered this morning. So we're going to get deliverance, amen? So if you fall on the ground, if you vomit, if you sweat, if you cry, if you bawl, if you squall, hey, join the crowd. We are family. I got all my sisters in me. Amen. So do your thing. And people around him, Jesus' name, Jesus, out, out, out. Assist. Amen. Assist. All right. We're going to talk about serpents, witches, and idols this morning. Remember, oh, yeah. Remember what, uh, what our beautiful hostess with the mostest Liz said last night about idols. We got to get rid of them. And we're going to show you the connection between witches, idols, and serpents. Look, you've been going after Jezebel and you didn't realize that Jezebel gets her power from the idols she worshipped. Jezebel didn't have power. It was from the idols she worshipped that she got her power. So you're trying to kick Jezebel out, and you don't realize that you got idols in your life, and you're getting your butt kicked because you got something in you that's in common with that witchcraft because you got idolatry. So we have to kick that to the curb. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Jesus said in John 14, 30, he said the prince of this world is coming, but he's got nothing in me that's in common with him, so he has no power over me. The devil will not have any power over you if you don't have anything in you that's in common. So we have these idols in our life, and it's connected to the witchcraft, and it's connected to the serpents. And I'm going to show you that. I mean, look at what it said in, in 1 Samuel 15, where he's talking to, to Saul, the, you know, and Saul had just disobeyed God by going and doing what his own thing was. And what did Samuel say to him? He said, uh, rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as idolatry. They're connected. They're connected. Quit being stubborn and falling after your idols. Because <laughs> that causes you to be in rebellion and having witchcraft on you. And then that witchcraft, when those witches are cursing you, those curses are carried out by serpents. You don't understand, this is a three, evil three-chord strand. Witches and serpents always work together. Where's that in the Bible? Acts 16, the woman with the spirit of divination. Remember, she's following Paul around, saying, these men are here to show you the way of the most high God, the way to salvation. So there she is. She's saying stuff that sounded very godly. How many know the snake speaks? And it's going to sound like stuff that God would say to you. People get way off track. They get all twisted because they're hearing a voice and they think it's God, but it's not. It's a snake because snakes speak. And they work with witches. She had a spirit of divination. Divination is witchcraft. When you look up that word divination, it's a one-word meaning. It means this. Ready? Python. Python. It was a snake that was talking to oh God. It was a snake that was talking to her through her. Saying, these men are here to show you the way of the most high God, the way to salvation. If you're feeling like oppressed, depressed, anxious, all spun out, like, wow, you want to you quit, you want to stop, you, you, you don't even want to go further. But you're hearing the voice of God just saying, you're hearing that voice say, you need to fast more, you need to pray more. And hey, don't get me wrong, I fast, I pray, I worship. These are keys to bringing the presence. But if it starts to become uh, said to you in a way that you think it's coming from God, but it's, con it's making you feel condemned, God only convicts you, he doesn't condemn you. So it's probably not God's voice, it's probably the sneaky snake speaking to you. And it's a python. What does a python do? It wraps itself around its victims and squeezes the life out of them. If you feel like you're having the life squeezed out of you, because you probably have a serpent around you. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to scare nobody. I'm just trying to tell you the truth. Look, Jesus told us something. Let's see if we have it. See if we have the graphic here. This is from Luke 10, 19. It says, this is Jesus talking. He says, behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by in any means hurt you. Okay, so here's Jesus. He's telling us 
the one who came to destroy the works of the enemy is now imputing to us that same ability. He's giving us authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. All, all, so that nothing will show in any wise harm us. Do you know what that word authority means? It means, it's the, it's the Greek word exosia. You know what it means in, in the Greek? It means this, ready? The power of judicial decisions. One of the ways that you're going to take out these serpents today is by taking them to court. But you're not going to just take them to court. How many people know about the courts of heaven? I'm not going to teach heavily on that, but it is in here. Okay? What, listen to me. Did you ever believe that you could take a snake to court? You can. This is a higher realm. You see, right now we're like going and we're begging God, please take this thing away from me. What is this? What is this thing? It's probably a snake. Might not be, but it could be. Please take this thing away from me. Please stop doing that. You've been given exosia authority. That's the power of judicial decisions, meaning you've been given the right to go up and adjudicate in the court. Not just go up and open a claim and have your claim be heard. And hopefully, you know, well, because of Jesus, you're going to get a great return. You're going to get a great decree from the court. You're going to win your court case. No, you're going to go up as a judge in the court, ascension, you're going to live in the ascended life, living in the court, judging, releasing your exosia authority, your power of judicial decisions against these serpents who are trying to harm you. The word harm, you know what it means? A criminal who has broken the law in some way. These snakes are criminals. They've broken the law. They're working with witches. They're carrying out their curses. Well, Jesus already became a curse for us. So that makes them lawbreakers. Did you hear what I said? They are criminals, and they've been, they have been attacking you. They've been committing crimes against you. These snakes are sneaky people. Right now, there's a bunch of people in here that are carrying a, a, a demonic serpent, and they don't even know it. What's the, what's the pre, what, 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 what is the example of that in the Bible? Paul, Paul's in a shipwreck. He gets out of the shipwreck. It's a rainy night. He goes and he gathers up a bundle of sticks, right? He doesn't realize that in my gathering up the bundle of sticks, he's picked up a poisonous viper and he's actually walking around carrying a snake with him and he doesn't know it. You know why? Because serpents are masters of camouflage. Genesis 3 says the serpent was the most subtlest beast of the field. They're crafty. They're sneaky. Even in the natural, you go out into the desert. I, I just moved from Arizona. I lived in Arizona for a long time. You go out in the desert. When you go out in the desert, if there, there could be a rattlesnake right there, and you would never see it unless you heard it. You hear it shaking its tail if you get too close. Hopefully right on time that you can avoid being bit. But you don't see it because the the, the the scales, they blend in to the desert. An anaconda snake can be 800 pounds, 20 feet in length, and silently slither through the trees and drop around down its victim, wrap around it, and crush it before it even knew it was coming. Why? Because they're masters of camouflage technology. It is very hard to see a snake. I remember I, I walked in deliverance ministry for years before I, I, I knew that I was, I was crawling with serpents. Because then God gave me the revelation about this and how to see them. Paul, Paul, he's picked up a bundle of sticks. Snakes can look just like a stick. So he doesn't even realize he's picked up a snake and he's carrying it around with him. Amen? And he only sees that he's carrying around with him when he throws that bundle of stick into the fire. Do you understand, the more fiery you are with your passion towards Jesus, the more you read his word and yeah, you fast and you pray and the more you have a heart for God. And if you don't, if you feel dull inside your heart, ask God to you ignite your heart and set it on fire because when that happens, these snakes are going to run. They hate fire. Snakes hate fire. Firemen will tell me, uh, the most dangerous part of putting out a fire, a forest fire, is not the fire itself sometimes. Sometimes it's all the snakes that are running out, slithering out of the forest from the fire. Snakes hate fire. Fire drives serpents out of hiding. That's why we have to be a fiery church in this hour, because there's a snake attack happening in the earth. 
Paul was carrying on a bundle of sticks. That word bundle, you know what it means? The multitude of men. The serpent is hiding amongst the multitude of men. The multitude of men are carrying around the serpent. That's why we have to get in the fire. We have to start blazing in the fire. Jesus told us we're supposed to get rid of these snakes. Look, you know the, the, the com Great Commission, Mark 16, Great Commission. You've all read it, right? I hear people preach on that all the time, but they leave out part of the Great Commission. It's, okay, we're going to go into baptize the nations, preach the gospel, uh, drive out demons, heal the sick, and then they'll slide over the, last, the, the one part right there and take up servants. Because they don't want to talk about what that looks like. What does take up serpents mean? The word take up there is iro. It actually means it's ready. It means to remove anything that's attached to anything. These snakes, I'm telling you right now, listen to me, listen to me. I'm a snake expert, snake hunter, hello. Shh. Snake hunter. Shh. They're attached to anything. They're attached to your money. Where's that in the Bible? Python, the woman with the spirit of divination. She won for her master's much gains. The snake was in charge of making the money. Illegal gains for her masters. So what do you think that same serpent's going to do to your money? It's going to squeeze. It's going to do what a python does. Squeeze out your gains. As soon as I got rid of the python on our ministry, three days later, I got a $100,000 check. Because the python was no longer squeezing out my gains. And it can squeeze out your gains when you're growing in your business or growing in your, in your you know, relationships or growing in favor or growing in your city to have influence in your city and your church. you got to get rid of the python. It's squeezing out your gains. These serpents can attach themselves to anything. They can attach themselves to your marriage. I've seen more people getting divorced because of the twisting, fleeing serpent leviathan. He twists. He twists, the, oh, oh, he twists stuff coming out of the mouth, into the ears, you name it. Oh, my gosh. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been fighting with the hubs, and he'll get all, like, very stubborn. Like, no, I didn't do that. No, I ain't going to do that. No, I don't want to do that. <laughs> the three no's. No, I ain't going to do that. No, I didn't do that. No, I don't want to do that. No, no, no. And I'd be like, mm, mm, mm. I go in my room, and I pick up my XOC authority, and I say, I judge that twisting fling serpent right now. I judge that altar of pride. Right now, I judge it. I judge it in his soul. I judge it in every part of his body. I judge it in his mind. I judge it in the way he thinks. I judge it in the way he talks. I judge it in myself. And then I come out, and, they, and he'll come out and go, honey, I'm so sorry. That's the way, uh-huh, uh-huh, I like it, uh-huh, uh-huh, that's the way, uh-huh, uh-huh, I like it, uh-huh, uh-huh. Y'all better get busy, start judging, oh, we're going to go into that. Start judging that altar that's at work in your hubs or your, or your wife or whatever, because that's a snake speaking to you, hello, the snake speaks. Started in the garden, eat from this tree, you won't die, you're right. That serpent will twist you and make you eat from the wrong tree and force you out of your paradise garden. Did you hear what I said? Those snakes are attached to anything. That's why Jesus said, we must take up serpents. The word take up again is iro. It means to remove anything that's attached to anything. These snakes are on your marriage. They're on your money. They're on your relationships. They're on your businesses. They're on your churches. They're on your physical body. I got videos. I don't have time to play them all. But trust me, when I tell you these stories, I got it on video. So I'm not exaggerating. I'm not leaving stuff out. I'm not, ex you know, making anything bigger than what it is. It's for real. I've seen some crazy miracles. I went to a meeting in Baltimore, and I was sitting in the front row, and the worship was on. And I thought the worship leader was down here like this, worshiping at the microphone, because she was so short, right? Well, then when I went up to minister, I walked up and I realized she wasn't on her knees. She was standing up. She had a torso just like me, but little legs. Little tiny legs. So afterwards, I go back, go back, to, the, I go back to the green room, and she's back in the green room. And she tells me the story. She goes, I had a dream about a couple days ago. And I wanted to tell you because you were talking about the serpents. I go, yeah, what happened? She goes, I dreamed that this kangaroo came walking up out of this field. It had a baby in its pouch, and it had a big python snake wrapped around it. And it looked at me. And it said, broken bones. And then it walked away. 
And I looked at her and I said, well, for one, kangaroos don't walk. They hop. I said, I know exactly what that dream means. She goes, what? I go, kangaroo's your mom. You're the baby in the pouch. The python squeezed you while you were in the pouch until it broke your bones, and that's why you're born like that. And she goes, oh, my God. So I picked up my XOC authority, the power of judicial decisions. I prayed maybe 30 seconds for her. I judged that thing that happened to her in the womb and that serpent that was on her mother. And by the way, her mother died of a respiratory disease. Yeah, python <laughs> wraps around you and you cannot breathe. And I judged that snake on her behalf and she went, whoop bam and grew under my hand in front of everybody in the green room. Worthy is your name, Jesus. Woo! Okay. She sent me a video later on. She, she was the worship leader, so she's, she came from another state. She got in her car, and she made this video. She goes, normally I have to see it all the way up when I drive home. She goes, but watch. She goes, my legs are bent now. And she went with the electronic seat adjuster and went, Then she sent me a second video when they made their first stop at like a place to get gas and some, you know, something to drink. And she's got her foot now up on the steering wheel. She's going, look at this. She goes, I have an arch. I've never had an arch in my life. I grew an arch. That was a first for me. I was like, I did not know. You sneaky snake. Did not know you, would do, you could do that. You would not believe this stuff. I had a guy, he had, from when he was a kid, this is crazy. When he was a kid, he started, it was called Shizon, a disease called Shizon. And what it would do is this little ball of hard material would start growing in his eye. And then pretty soon it would grow and grow and grow until it covered the whole eye. And like nine times when he was a little boy, he had to have it lasered off. With a laser. Can you imagine that when you're like a little kid and your eyes like one of those horror movies where they put forks in your eye to hold your eyelid open and here comes the, the laser cuts it open. How terrifying for like a nine-year-old kid. He had that like done over and over again as a child. So somebody told him, oh, you need to listen to Katie Seuss's, uh, you know, Serpent and the Soul. So he goes, all right. You know, he's in the car one day and he's listening to it and all of a sudden he said, I was... I was there, and I was going, fire, 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 <laughs> because fire drives snakes out of hiding. And all of a sudden, this big bow constrictor in the spirit, not in the natural, came out, all the way out of his eye, turned around and looked at him. And he was like, bird, bird, pulled over to the side of the road, grabbed the snake. He said it was so long, he had to use like two hands to keep on pulling like this. And he's pulling it out, and he looks over, and there's this guy that's next to him going, And he goes, sorry, hey, just pulling a snake out of my eye. <laughs> now, when that happened, the ball had started to grow again. And it went away immediately as soon as he pulled that snake out of his eye. Immediately. Golly, geez. Thank you, Lord. This is real. I've had people grow collagen, or uh, yeah, what did I not collagen? Collagen. Yeah, let's pull snakes out of our face. Yeah, cool, man. Woo! Go collagen out of my face. Yeah. There goes those wrinkles. Woo! <laughs> you know, pulling the stuff, the cartilage, baby. I've had people like bone on bone, no, totally no cartilage, arthritic. One lady had just bought a townhouse and then it started forming. And she would have to drag herself up the stairs every night to get to the bedroom. Ooh, I said, man, we're going to take off those serpents. We're going to take them up. Jesus told us to do it. Prophetically reach down and pull them off of wherever they are on your body. Ooh, she went down. She pulled them off her knees. And instantly, cartilage grew back. No more arthritis. She's up there going, oh, Jesus. Jesus. Up on the stage. I mean, stuff out the Wow. You have no idea. This is real. This is real. And we have to do what Jesus said. We've got to take up serpents. That was what his command was. Amen. Not just preach the gospel. Not just drive out demons. Not just heal the sick. But take up serpents also. If you haven't pulled a snake off yourself or your, your neighbor, 
your friend, your family, your loved one, you're not fulfilling all of the Great Commission. Challenge. So what allows these snakes to come in in the first place? Well, number one is sin. Let's look at that really quick. I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty. I'm just telling you the open door so we can avoid them. Okay? This one is, oh, I didn't write it down. It's Ecclesiastes. I don't know if you can find that, but that'd be really great. It says, he diggeth a, he that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. And whoever breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall come in and bite him. What would break the hedge of protection God has installed around his peeps? Sin. Sin. No condemnation. Warning, warning. Bing, 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 bing. Warning, warning. Sin will break a hole in the hedge. Let's just talk about some of them. Stuff with your mouth. Okay? Romans 3, 13 through 14 says, Their throat is an open tomb. Their tongues, they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Stop being angry. Okay, you're talking to the most angry person on the planet. Right here. Most angry. Okay, I was the most angry person on the planet. And I was bitter, and I was violent, and I was mean, and I went after you if you did something I didn't like. I, oh, you're on my list. Goodbye. So, look, don't, don't let, listen, don't let your mouth become a landing strip for the poison of ass to be under your tongue. Okay? Stuff is happening. This place, this planet has gone cray-cray. All right? And there's stuff. Now, am I saying you can't discuss all the stuff that's happening? No, we have to do that. But you need to watch the tone you're saying it in. You need to watch how you're talking about it. You need to watch how you discuss issues with peeps. People, if you're having a struggle with people, you need to be careful how you discuss it. Do you hear what I'm saying? You need to be able to do it in a mature, Christ-like manner and don't just talk about it just to share and gossip and make people look bad. If you need to talk about it only with people that are necessary to know the information. And then all of you watch your, in peace, possess your soul. Because when, you're, when you start releasing bitterness and cursing, even when you just start complaining about stuff like, oh my God, that thing, that thing happened again. Oh my God, another day from H-E double toothpicks. Oh my God. You know, like... You've got to be careful because the more you do that, guys, the more the venom of ass will be under your tongue. Now, you know when that happens, that when you talk, you're literally spitting venom at people? You can make people sick with snake venom. Did you hear what I said? This snake venom thing is a big deal. Look, people are like, snake venom? What are you talking about? I'm telling you right now, I don't know how the technology works. I have not gotten that download about the technology. But when you get bit by these poisonous serpents, because some are poisonous, some are not, Okay, you can actually get cancer and sicknesses and diseases and all that, and I'll prove it to you in the scriptures. But venom, I have seen, I have seen people have big tumors on their neck or breast, and I've just commanded the venom. I've said, I'll speak to you, dirt body. I command your dirt body to spit out that venom right now. And they, I, I've seen it. Like one lady had a, oh my gosh, she had a baseball-sized tumor on her breast, hard as a rock with a moon crater in it. It had rough edges around the edge, okay, and it was pouring out, the, it was draining out this stinky, putrid smelling goop. She'd had it for four years, okay. Hour on the phone with her, walking in my XOC authority to, to have power of judicial decisions to trample the serpent. And over all the power of the enemy, so nothing can anyways harm her. And she had witchcraft in her history. Remember, witches curse, snakes carry it out. And within, within an hour, the tumor shrinks 45%, starts pouring out this yellowish, clear-looking liquid that looked just like snake venom. Does that for five days. Now the skin is pink. It's growing back, regenerating. The crusty edges are filling in. And the tumor has gotten like way, way small. And her breast is regenerating every single day. Wow. 
Watch your mouth. Don't have the poison of ass be under, the venom of ass be under your lips. Because you'll get sick and somebody else will get sick. Every time you complain or you're bitter or whatever else, it's inviting a serpent. Amen. Do you hear what I said? Okay, you hear what I said? Okay, also having a religious spirit. Religious spirit will invite, will invite uh, a, a venomous viper. Now you think, well, nobody in here is religious. Well, I thought that too about myself. I'm not accusing anybody. But I remember when I got this revelation about the religious spirit being connected to, uh, to the brood of vipers. That's what Jesus and John the Baptist called the Pharisees. Oh, you brood of vipers. What does that mean? They were men being controlled by serpents. Men being controlled by demonic serpents who spit venom at people. Did you hear what I said? I remember when I first got that, I was like, I had this little vision. I was like, repenting, God, if I have any religious spirit in me, like, get it, get it, get it, you know, put it under your blood because I don't want to have, you know, uh, like a brood of viper spirit controlling me and all that. Forgive me and, and cleanse me with your blood. And I run to the cross right now in the name of Jesus. And I had this vision. I'm carrying this, this, this uh, briefcase and had all my teachings in it. And I was so proud. Look at me with my teachings. They're so awesome. And I went, and I went to, and I, oh, I was opening up the briefcase to bring out my awesomeness stuff, right? And I opened it up, and the snake jumps out right at my face. I was like, whoa. I grabbed that thing, and in the natural, my, my ears started to burn. And I was like, what is this? It was like burning, burning, burning. This year, it had always been a little bit of hard of hearing. So it's burning, and all of a sudden, it pops, and I hear Psalm 58, 4. So I went to it, and it says, the deaf adder that stoppeth the ear. You see, the Pharisees had the deaf adder that stopped at the ear on them. You know why? Because they were standing right in front of Jesus and they couldn't hear a word he said. My ear got opened. I see a lot of ear miracles happening when people repent of their religious attitudes. You know, Holy Spirit will tell you what it is if you've got something like that. Amen? But you've got to get rid of it. God told me in this, in this season right now that the deaf out of the stuff of the ear is being released to stop you from hearing what God wants you to do. You're going, God, what do I do? I can't hear nothing. What, what, what am I supposed to do now? What, tell me, tell me, tell me. I just want to do your will. I just want to do your will. And you can't hear nothing because deaf out of the stuff of the ear. Hello. And he says that it's coming on people, especially with finances. You're looking for financial strategies on how to win in this economy that's going sideways. And you can't quite get the download. Because the deaf out of the stop of the ear. I'm just saying. Remember Paul? Okay, okay, think about this, think about this, think about this, think about this. Paul, remember Paul when he was hit? Remember he was, he had total religious spirit. Remember he even talked about, he said that he was trained by the high mucka mucka uh, Pharisee called Gamil. Remember him? Remember, remember that scripture? Right? So he was trained by the Pharisee. That he, he even said to himself, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Remember that about Paul? Then he gets struck with the, the, the ball of light. It's Jesus, the Lord, appears to him on the road, and he gets knocked off his horse, right? Then what happens when Ananias goes to pray for him? Scales fell from his eyes. Scales. God told me, that's a snake scale, you know. I see cataracts disappear like that when I pull snakes out of people's eyes. One lady, she had this cataract in her eye. Everybody was soaking her, and I... They, they called me over and said, we can't get the rest of it. A little bit is gone, but we can't get the rest. So I walked over and said, what's going on? She goes, well, I can still see it. It looks like a scale. As soon as she said scale, I went, oh. I didn't even, like, I didn't even get through with the decree. I put my hand on her head. I said, in the name of Jesus, I judge. As soon as I said, power of judicial decisions, exosia. I judge that. She goes, oh, there it goes. Oh, there it goes. Just like that. Easy. Snake scale. You're going to see eye miracles. You're gonna, your eyes are going to open in the spirit. You're going to have ear miracles. Your ears are going to open in the spirit. You're going to hear better. You're going to see better once you get these snakeified. Did you hear what I said? 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 Okay. Look, don't even, don't even think the serpent leaves food out of this. What was the first thing the serpent did to peeps? Eat this food. Yummy. It's doing the same thing. He, the snake uses food to shipwreck you. A lot of you are under condemnation right now because you can't control your eating. 
You can't stop eating this or that. You're stuck like Chuck. Don't believe that that voice inside your head that says you, go need, you need to go have a third piece of pie is actually your voice because the snake speaks. I'm serious. I had a lady, I pulled the snake out of her belly. She had eating, eating disorder. She actually physically lost five pounds. She had weighed herself before she came to the meeting. She said, I happened to weigh myself before they came to the meeting. After you did that, I felt so light. I went, I went back home and weighed myself, and I lost five pounds. I don't know how that works, but it did. And man, she's right. Now she's got control over the food. Are you starting to hear what I'm saying to you? Man, I'm telling you, dope, pills, alcohol, watch it. Look, I got to, this is maybe I'm, maybe I'm just preaching because of this, because of my own convictions. But I don't drink, I don't do, I don't smoke, I don't do nothing, I don't take pills, I don't do nothing. Why? Because I used to do all that, hello? <laughs> all of it. And it ain't good, it ain't, you, you know, like, okay, if you drink a little bit. If you think you can, if you think you can manage it without a, like one half glass going to a glass going to two glasses, good on you. Okay, that's good. I'm glad you have that type of self control. But for some of you, you can't. Some of you cannot. And what does it say about that? Leviticus 20:27. 20, if there be a man or a woman in whom a python or is a spirit of divination. Oh, that's not the one. Sorry. Pink. Proverbs 23. Do not gaze at the wine when it's red. When it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly, in the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Don't give the snake and the viper a landing strip. Did you hear what I said? Amen. How do we get rid of it? You know, these are just some of the sins. I could just go on and on and on. I'm not trying to, again, condemn you. I'm just trying to warn you. Okay, I'm trying to warn you. Okay, Pride is a big one. We're going to talk about pride for the Leviathan and all of that. But how do you get rid of it? Number one, the cross, of course, of course, right? So think about it. What was the very first prophecy about Jesus in the entire Bible? It's in Genesis 3, where the serpent has beguiled the woman, and now God is coming in with a judgment against that serpent. And what does he say? The seed of the woman, capital S, seed, Jesus Christ, will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. Very first prophecy about Christ that I know of, anyway, in the Bible. And where was that crushing? At the cross. Glory. Do you understand every time you look at the cross, think about the cross, celebrate the cross, sing about the cross, take communion. Every time you do any of that, what are you doing? You're crushing the head of the serpent. And you're wiping away all that sin and everything else. Did you hear what I said? The cross is majorly important in this. Because this is where the crushing of the serpent took place. Amen? So run to the cross. Look at the cross. Think about the cross. Talk about the cross. Meditate on the cross. Celebrate the cross. <laughs> Take the communion. Do it in remembrance of what he did at the cross. And you're going to see that you're going to see a big difference happening for you. Because the more you celebrate the cross, the more the crushing takes place. So you've got to have the blood of Jesus. And the thing about it is, is the blood also, the Bible says in Leviticus 17, 11, says the blood atoneth for the soul. So what does that mean? Every time you celebrate the cross, think about it, you take communion, whatever, the blood of Jesus is atoning for all those sins in your soul when you went off and complained, when you, when you got bitter at somebody, when you got religious spirited, when you got prideful, when you were involved in witchcraft, when you have idolatry in your life, all those things connected to the serpent. The blood atoneth for the soul. What does that mean? That the blood actually comes in and cleanses your soul of the sin and the wounds that came from that sin that are in common with the serpent. Next time you take communion, next time you, 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 you think about the cross, next time you, you worship the Lord in that way and, and gaze on him hanging there, whew, think about that and just say, I as I look at you, your blood, it, it is, it's atoning for my soul. It's washing away the bitterness in my soul and the, and the discontentment and the complaining and the times when I talked about people and when I got religious spirited and the pride and, 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 and the food thing, and I'm, I'm totally hooked. And it cleanses the soul of that desire. It cleanses the soul of that sin. It cleanses the soul of what you have in common with the serpent because that's where the crushing took place. Did you hear what I said? 
The New Testament says the blood cleanses our consciousness of dead works. Wow. The consciousness is part of the soul, man. The soul is a big player here in this whole serpent thing because remember, the devil, Jesus said, the prince of this world is coming. There's nothing in me that's in common with him, so he has no power over me. Nothing in me, in me, in me. What do you have in you that's in common? Get rid of it with the blood. Then he will have no power over you. Did you hear what I said? It's very important. Okay. So the blood, the blood, cross, the blood and the cross, fire too. Remember I said fire drives that snake out of hiding. There's Paul carrying the bundle of sticks. He doesn't realize he's picked up a serpent. He's walking around carrying a serpent. <laughs> I always walk around carrying a bunch of serpents. I see people walking around carrying serpents all the time. But when he threw it on the fire, that fire dr drove that serpent out of hiding. I remember once I walked into a meeting, and as soon as I walked in, there was this guy standing there, and he had his arm like this. And I looked at him, and there was a snake on his arm. And I walked up to him and go, how's that snake? Is it getting heavy? You want to get rid of it yet? He said, what? I said, what's wrong with your arm? I went back to planet Earth. What's wrong with your arm? Oh, I've had gout for 23 years. And he goes, it's gotten particularly bad, and I've got these lumps. I go, that snake pockets is. <laughs> I'm sorry, people think I'm a nut. <laughs> he says, that's pocket. Uh, he goes, those are, you know, I don't know. They're like, they're like mushy, but they're hurt. I go, those are pockets of snake venom. <laughs> I said, that's a snake on your arm. And he goes, okay. I said, let me get rid of it. <laughs> so the fire. So I released fire. So what the fire is doing, right, is it driving the snake out of hiding, right? Like a different Paul. But the fire also is burning up the stuff in here in the soul that's in common. Okay? Do you remember what John the Baptist said when he was talking to, oh, the brood of, he was down there baptizing the Jordan, and here comes the Pharisee. He says, oh, you brood of vipers who told you to flee from the coming wrath. He goes, now repent. So he's telling them the keys to getting rid of these snakes that are controlling them. First says, repent, go to the cross, run, look at Jesus hanging there for you, bleeding out, where he crushed the serpent's head. Repent, and then the fire is coming, the axe is at the root of the tree, it's going to be thrown into the fire, and it's going to be burned up. And then he says, one who is coming who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and and said, he will, separate, he will take his winnowing fork and separate the chaff from the wheat and burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. What is that? Inside all of us, there's chaff and there's wheat. There's good wheat stuff. No, Siri, I'm not talking to you. Sorry. She gets sassy like that while I'm preaching. Okay. I want to change her out for somebody else. I, honestly, do, do you ever have fights with Siri? I do. Siri, what? Stop it. Are you listening? No. Okay. Inside of all of us, there's chaff and there's wheat. There's the really good stuff, the wheat. Good attitudes. You, maybe you're a person who's full of love. You're a joyful person. You, you are a person that serves. But you are also got some chaff in you. You also get really upset if people don't do what you say. You also hold on to memories that you should have dumped to the curb years ago. There's chaff and there's wheat inside of each one of us. And the chaff inside of us lets the, who was John the Baptist talking to when he said this? Oh, you brood of vipers. The chaff in you is the uncommon ground. It's the stuff, the junk in your trunk that allows the serpents to control you, to manipulate you, to ruin your life, to strangle, to squeeze you out. Okay. So he says, one is coming who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He will take us winning fork, separate the chaff from the wheat, meaning I'm going to save the good wheat, but I'm going to get rid of this chaff. And how am I going to get rid of it? I'm going to burn it up with unquenchable fire. So see, the fire not only drives that serpent out of hiding, but it will burn up the junk in your trunk. That is a landing strip for the serpent. That's why you want to soak in fire. You want to soak in fire all the time. Go back to it on a regular basis. I remember uh, about, I don't know, maybe eight years ago, I developed a hole in my breast about the size of the tip of my pinky finger. It's pretty deep. And I was like, what is that? 
So I was on tour. I was in Ohio or something like that. I'm up midnight. It's, I already preached a message. I'm like, what is going on, God? He goes, I want you to soak in fire all night, and I'll show you what's up. I said, all right. So I turned on Missy Edwards, classic Missy Edwards, all consuming fire on repeat. You know, repeats like every two minutes. Some song's only like two minutes long. And so I'm sitting there, it's like midnight, and I'm like, all oh, consuming fire. You're my heart's desire. Burning flame. Love, come baptize us. Come baptize us. I'm like doing that all night. In the morning, I see a vision. I see a vision of this, like, bloody uh, linen wrapped around my breast and my body. It was all bloody. And then I see a snake up on its tail, and it's got the triangular jaw. That's the poisonous kind striking at me. And I go, what's up, Lord? And he goes, look up the word linen. I looked it up. It's, it's fabric that covers a wound. He said, you had a wound in your soul. You had an in common ground. You had chaff in there. I'm covering it with my blood. You soaked in fire all night, so it was burning up that chaff, and it drove that snake out of its hiding place. I said, what was it trying to do? He says, oh, it was going to give you cancer. Oh, I got really mad. Oh, I was so mad. I was so mad. I was like, oh, devil, you touched the goods. I said, oh, the pup I ain't going to be happy. Oh, I was so mad. The Lord said, take up that serpent. You saw its head. When you see the head, you can pull it off. Look, you can take up serpents, remove anything that's attached to anything. You can pull these snakes off of you. The only snake you don't touch is Leviathan, and we'll talk about that in a minute, okay? But I actually, I put on a metal glove because I was like, that thing ain't going to bite my hand. I unwound it from my breast, and I cast it out. So then I go home, right? I cast it to the fiery pit, commanded it to burn and not return. I go home. So then the Lord says, now, pound communion. And we're going to talk. We're going to do that. I keep on saying that, but we are. Okay. We're going to do that. And so I started taking communion, taking communion, taking communion. And uh, for three nights in a row, I'm balled up in my bed like this holding my boob. Sorry, I'm just going to say it. Going, oh, because it hurts so bad. And I'm thinking, oh, I made it mad. <laughs> I didn't get rid of it. I made it mad. It's still there. And it was just like, oh, it was aching every, only night when I was asleep. Three nights. Well, it wasn't that I didn't get rid of it. It was, what happened was I got up on the third morning, walked into the bathroom, went to take a shower and looked, and the hole had completely filled in. The pain that I felt was not the serpent still being there. It was the regeneration of the flesh. See that? But it all started with a fire soak. Everybody say fire. fire. Say fire. fire. Say fire. 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 Put your hand on your neighbor and start decreeing fire of them. Go. Fire, 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 fire. Do you know that fire actually will burn up the chaff? When Jesus separates the chaff from the wheat, he burns up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Do you remember the Acts 2? The Acts 2, they're in the upper room, and the fire comes down. If you want, go with it. Go to, go to that with me. Go to, like, Acts 2, but do it in the Amplify Classic. Because this is what it says the fire did when it went around. I don't know if we got that up on the board, but it would be great if we could put it up there. It says, and there appeared to them, this is verse 3, tongues of resembling fire which were separated, distributed, and which settled on each one of them. And they were all, listen to me, this is verse 4 now, ready? And they were all filled, ready? 
diffused throughout their souls with the Holy Spirit and fire. Do you understand? The fire don't just come down and wave on your head and look hot. <laughs> hot. Get it? Fire? Hot. It goes, it diffuses into your soul. And it burns up the chaff with unquenchable fire, that, that stuff in you that you have in common with a demonic serpent. Put your hand on your belly. Now say fire. 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 Fire diffuse. Fire diffuse. Fire diffuse. Burn that chaff fire. Holy fire. Baptize us with holy fire. Baptize us with holy fire. Burn up the chaff. Diffuse into our souls. Diffuse into our souls. Come on, lay your hands on your neighbor and go at it. Command that fire to diffuse into their soul. Command that fire to burn up the chaff. Come on, to burn up the chaff in their souls. Decree it. Command that fire to burn up that chaff. Command that fire to burn up that chaff. Command that fire to burn up that chaff. I command it. 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 Fire burning, burning up with fire, burning up with fire, burning up with fire. The chaff is being burnt. It's diffusing into your mind, into your will, into your emotions. Fire, 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 fire. Fire, 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 fire. Shane Mali Mali Mo, Shane 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 Mali Mo. Fire, 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 fire. Fire. Yeah, you think I'm kidding, right? I'm not kidding at all, right? This is real. Look, 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 look. After Paul throws, you know, he's carrying around a snake. He don't know it. Hello? Carrying around a snake. He don't know it. Hello? Because masters of camouflage technology throws in the fire. The heat of the fire drives that serpent out of his hiding place. It bites him, but he's left unharmed. I think it was holy fire, burning up the chaff inside his soul. And then what happens? He goes and he does revival after that. He goes and he prays. That island is swarming with venomous vipers, okay, swarming. The, the, the islanders knew how dangerous that thing was. If you got bit, you were going to die. They, that's why they thought that he was a criminal, that Paul was a criminal. Oh, he got bit, he's a criminal. Oh, but then when he didn't die, they're like, oh, no, he's a god. <laughs> Then he goes, what? After he, after he has dominion over the snake, he goes and he lays hands on Publius, and he gets healed, and then all the rest of the snake-infected people of the island come, and a revival starts. He, he, he prays for them, and they all get healed. <clears throat> Look, after you get desnakeified and you got dominion over the serpent and the fire, you're going to lay your hands on all your snake-infected people on your island, and they're going to get healed. And revival's going to break out. Look, God can't commission you for a big job until you get desnakeified. Look, 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 look at Moses. Look at Moses. Moses, do you know where Moses grew up? Where did Moses grow up? In Pharaoh's palace, right? Pharaoh's palace. Pull up Exodus 4, I forget what verse it is. I think it's like the second verse. He grew up in, in Pharaoh's palace. Now, Pharaoh wore a big crown. Do you remember what's on the crown of Pharaoh? Yeah, that's right. It was called Wadjet. In the Amplified Classic version of Exodus 4, it says that that serpent represented the royal power worn, by, uh, the crown, worn on the crown of Pharaoh. So Pharaoh, the ruling power over Pharaoh's household was the Wadjet, was the serpent. He wore it on his crown. Where did Moses grow up again? Okay, no, 
Where in Egypt? Pharaoh's household. So he grew up in the snake king's house. Now, listen, education was a big deal to the Egyptians. Okay, they were required to learn because the pharaohs were smart. They knew that the smarter their population was, the stronger their nation would be. Hmm, we should get that wave. <laughs> so every day, ooh, this is what's happening to us. Moses had to learn all this, all of his regular schooling, but also the big thing that they, they, they harped on in Egypt was they had to learn about all the gods that they worshipped. So here's Moses living in the snake king's household. What is one of the main gods that he's going to learn about every day and bring sacrifices to every day as part of his education? The serpent. You know, when that happens, what happens? You start carrying around a snake. You see all these people out there. I don't want to get political, but I'll just say a tiny, tiny bit. You see people out there, and they think that they're boys or girls, and girls are boys, and cuts off parts, and, and I'm this and I'm that. It's a serpent. They're swarming with snakes. Now, believe it or not, Moses, here's this holy guy. I mean, one of the most amazing, he was the most humblest man. He wrote about himself. Uh, yeah. Swarming with a snake. Really? Did Moses really have a snake? Was he caring? Was he like Paul? Had he been walking around his whole life? Paul only did it right there at the, on the beach of the island. Was Moses, from that point on, bringing sacrifices to the serpent and learning about the serpent and living in the serpent king's household, was he carrying around a snake and he didn't know it? Yes. How do we know that? Oh, it was within that time when he saw the tree that burned with fire but did not burn up. Do you ever wonder, do you know that God doesn't just pick a sign out of a hat and say, today I'm going to make a rainbow. Oh, that sounds like a good idea. Oh, but wait a minute. No, not a rainbow. Throw that, throw that piece of paper back in. Stir it, stir it, stir it. Oh, okay, let's see. Let's see what comes out. Oh, we're going to do a cloud today, a cloud with rain. Okay, no, God doesn't pick signs and wonders out of a hat. He does specific signs at specific times for specific reasons. So that day in Exodus 3, uh, God shows up as what? A burning bush full of fire, but it does not burn. Why does he pick that particular sign to show to Moses? Because Moses had been carrying around a serpent his whole life, and he didn't know it. And the fire was necessary to drive that snake out of hiding and to burn up all the chaff in his soul, all the woundedness from all the stuff he partook of when he lived in Pharaoh's household. Now, how do I know this is true? Because then in Exodus 4, everybody go to that. In the Amplified Classic, he had just met God up on the mountain. There's the tree that's on fire, does not burn. God says, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. And then he begins to commission Moses. You're going to go. You're going to, I hear my people crying out from Egypt. I've, I've heard their cry. I'm sending you, and you're going to free them from Egypt. And then Moses comes in the very beginning of Exodus 4, and he says, and Moses answered him, but behold, you can't commission me. You can't do this. They'll not believe me or listen to me or obey my voice. My people will say, the Lord has not appeared to you. And the second verse, the Lord says to him this, what is that in your hand? And he said, a rod. Do you think God doesn't know what Moses has in his hand? Why is he asking Moses, what is that in your hand? It's not that, it's because he doesn't know. He wants to know if Moses knows what he's been carrying around his whole life. Next verse. And God said to him, cast it on the ground, and he did. And so it became what it was the whole time, a serpent. Put it up. A serpent. The symbol of royal and divine power. Can we give a big hand for the people in the box? Because they've been amazing. They have been so amazing. Alice, why I oughta? No, I'm kidding. You did that on purpose to me. No, I'm kidding. Okay, look. And... He, he said, cast it on the ground. He did, and it became what it really was, a serpent, the symbol of royal and divine power worn on the crown of Pharaoh's, and Moses fled from before it. He'd been carrying around 
This, he thought that shepherd's rod was actually a shepherd's rod. No, no, it was a snake. He picked it up in Pharaoh's house. Where have you picked up a snake? And you can't be commissioned until you get rid of it. That's why God's going to meet you with a burning tree of fire that does not burn up. That, that fiery tree was necessary that day to burn up, to drive that serpent out of his hiding place so Moses could see what he was really carrying around, but also to burn up the chaff that was in him. Look, and it says that he fled from before it. Okay, why? Because at that point, he still had something in his soul in common with it. He was afraid of it. But then the next verse, the Lord says this, now pick it up by the tail. Okay, that's nuts. You don't tell anybody to pick up a snake by the tail. They'll swing around and bite you. So why is he telling him that now? Because the, in the fiery presence, not only had the fire driven that snake out of hiding, but it had burned up the chaff. And now Moses reached, reached down, picked it up by a tail, and it turned into the real rod of power. The rod of power that was not a snake anymore. It was the rod that was going to call down the plagues on the Egyptians. Part the Red Sea. Strike the rock and water would come out. As soon as you get the snake of fight in the fiery presence of God, you're going to have the real rod of power. Did you hear what I said? And you'll free people from captivity to Egypt. You'll part the Red Sea so they can escape. You'll lead them through the desert. You'll strike the rock when they need water, and water will come out. Did you hear what I said? All right, now, here we're going into the activation. Wow, what a long activation this is going to be. Sorry, I've done like eight sessions in one afternoon, one morning. Trauma is going to allow the snake. We talked about syndrome, now we're going to talk about trauma. And we're going to get healed of trauma. How many of you have been through a lot of trauma? Okay, let's talk about Paul. What happened before Paul got to the beach? A storm and a shipwreck. You remember that? Okay. Acts 27. I'm just going to scoot through it really quick. It says, soon afterwards, a wind of the violent character of a typhoon came bursting down on the island. Okay, so how many of you have been through the typhoon that just burst out of nowhere? That's called shock trauma. Okay. Said the ship was caught, unable to head against the wind. We gave up and let her drift. How many of you have been caught up in the trauma? And literally, you can't get out of it. It carries you along with it. How many of you have that? Then it says the, the ship was dangerously tossed by the violence of the storm. And the next day, we began to throw the freight overboard. How many of you have been in a dangerous storm that tossed you about and you actually lost a lot of your freight, your income? Your, your money, your savings accounts in the midst of the storm. How many of you had that happen? Okay. It says, on the third day, they threw out with their own hands the ship's tackle and the equipment. The ship's tackle are what guided and controlled the ship. And the furniture is what they rested on. How many of you lost control of the ship and you didn't even have any way to rest during that time because the storm was that bad? Raise your hand really big. I want to see really big hands. Okay, there we go. See, that's almost everybody. Says, then says, when neither sun nor moon nor stars were visible for many days and no small tempest kept raging about us, all hope of our being saved was finally abandoned. How many have given up, had given up hope? At some point you gave up hope. Okay. Now, what did Paul do about it? Well, he got, you know, he threw, that, he threw that bundle of sticks on the fire. But guess what? He also took communion on the boat. How many of you know that Paul took communion on the boat? This is important to know because communion is the place where Jesus, right, it's, it's what we do in remembrance of Jesus crushing the head of the seed of the serpent, right? This is done in remembrance of him, and it crushes the serpent's head. Paul took communion on the boat. You know why else that's important? Because when you go through that much trauma, that trauma will wound your soul and allow a landing strip for the serpent to bite you and cause you to get sick and die. But Paul, in the midst of a storm and a shipwreck, took communion on the boat. Did you hear me? Okay.
I'll prove it to you. Wow, I said I would be done at 12. Ha, ha, ha. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> when do you want me to be done? <laughs> I'll aim for 12, but we have to make it really fast. Here we go. Ready? It says this. Paul was now talking to everyone in the boat. He says, so I warn you, I urge you, I exhort you, I encourage you to take some food for your safety. He's talking to everybody on the boat now during the storm. For it will give you strength for not a hair of your head is to publish from your head any one of you. Having said these words, he took bread and gave thanks to God before them all, and he broke it and began to eat. That word bread there, you know what it means? The bread broken at the Lord's table. The word broke, you know what that means? The bread broken at the Lord's table. Paul took communion on the ship. We need to do that. Because when we do that, it's going to remove everything. It, it, it's going to crush the serpent's head. Now, when Jesus told us to take this cup and drink it, for this is the blood, the remission of sin for many, that word drink there, it's pino. If you look it up, it means to receive into the soul, which serves to refresh, nurse, and strengthen it. Meaning when you drink the cup, your soul gets healed of the trauma. We've got to get healed of trauma because because when he took that communion and he got out of the boat and the snake bit him, he shook it off and he was left unharmed. Left unharmed. Why? Because the fire and because he took communion, he crushed that serpent before it ever bit him. And he got healed in his soul of the trauma that he went through during the storm. Did you hear what I said? Okay. I want everybody to come up and get, get communion. Go back to your seat and hold it. Go. While you're doing that, start chanting fire. Can I have the worship team up here too? It's almost noon. I'll get it. No, don't worry. I'll get it. We need more bread, I think. We're about to run out. Yeah, you know what? We're supposed to be, but we're so far behind getting things straightened out. I think we gave a call, and it burned. but it hasn't happened yet. We want to be, though. Thank you. Yeah, I want to be on there.
Okay, guys, let's get back to our seats as fast as you can. Okay, you ready? Look, this is, this is real. There's a pattern that's happening in the earth right now. The enemy is creating storms like he did in Paul's day. Storms in the natural. Stuff going sideways, going crazy town. Okay, and it's all meant to get us wounded so that when we get bit by a serpent, it can take us out. I got one right here, thank you, Jesus. That's why we have to be in fire and we gotta take communion because this represents, we do this in remembrance of him. It represents Jesus crushing the serpent's head. And it also heals our soul because when you drink the cup of his blood, that word drink again is pino, you receive into the soul which serves to refresh and nurse and strengthen it. You know, in Numbers 21, it says that the Israelites, they had become much discouraged because of the journey, the Bible says. They said their soul had become much discouraged because of the journey. And then out of that discouragement, they began to speak against God and against Moses. Why did you bring out of us out of Egypt? We hate this manna. We loathe, our soul loathed this manna. And then they got bit by fiery snakes. Well, they said they, they, they were so discouraged by the trauma that they actually said they loathed the manna. Do you know that in Corinthians, in the New Testament, it says that they ate from the, they drank the spiritual drink and they ate the spiritual food. Then they drank the spiritual drink, which was from the rock, Jesus Christ, capital R. They were saying, in the desert, they ate and drank of Christ. They ate communion. Yeah, when the, when the rock was struck in the desert, water poured out. But when the rock was struck in the Christ, blood poured out, was, uh, was struck on the cross, blood poured out and we drink that was a foreshadowing they were it was a foreshadowing of Christ in the desert and them partaking of the living bread that came down from heaven the manna that came down every day I am the living bread your forefathers ate manna in the desert but I am the living bread and they said they their soul had begun to loathe the manna we cannot loathe the manna we cannot neglect the manna we cannot neglect communion in this hour what happened? They, the, Moses, they, they repented. That's the first step. Run to the cross and repent to get rid of these snakes. They got bit by fiery snakes. Many of them died. They repented. Oh, take the snakes away from us. We're sorry that we did that. We're sorry we spoke out of the discouragement of our mouth. You know, we complained about you and God, Moses. So they made a serpent on a pole. That represented Christ, just as the serpent was lifted up in the desert. So with the Son of Man must be lifted up. So they wouldn't eat the manna, they wouldn't eat the living bread, so they had to look at it. And the Amplified says they looked at it expectantly, attentively, and observingly, and then they would live. Look at Christ now, expectantly, attentively, observingly, so you can live. Trauma, their souls were much discouraged because of the way. The enemy is going to create storms, guys. Look at what happened to Job lost his family, lost his sheep, his herds, all his kids struck in his whole body with painful boils. And then in chapter three, he's saying, my soul is bitter. And in the middle of that, he said, now let curse my birthday. Let those who are skilled at cursing, that's witches, loose Leviathan on my birthday. 
See, he got, he went through the trauma. He got bitter about it. And then he, even in his ancient wisdom and stupidity, said, let those witches curse my birthday. I don't want to live and let Leviathan carry out that curse. That's the same chapter where it says, curse the breast, curse the womb. Curse that day I was born. Leviathan will carry out a curse on the breast and the womb. If we let trauma make us bitter. Did you hear what I said? How many of you have gotten bitter from the trauma? Come on, it's okay. We're all family. Raise up your hands really high. Let me see. Okay. We're supposed to examine ourselves before we take the communion. If we do, we will not face divine judgment, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11. Say, Lord God. Say, Lord God. I've been through a lot. I've been through a storm like Paul. I lost all I, I had. They tried to steal my lifeboat and leave me behind on a sinking ship. I lost control of the ship. I couldn't even rest during the storm. I gave up all hope of being saved. And now I'm like the Israelites in the desert, much discouraged because of the way. And I've spoken out of that discouragement. I've become bitter, angry, offended, afraid, depressed, anxious, and fiery serpents have been biting me. But I'm running to the cross where you crush the head of the serpent. Take your blood right now, Lord. Cleanse my sin. Your blood atoneth for my soul. I know all the handwritten requirements that were against me have been nailed to your cross. And you've made a public spectacle of the enemy through your cross. I will never be so foolish again to be like Job and release curses out of my trauma. To even allow Leviathan to touch me, to carry out a curse against me. I decree Jesus already became a curse for me. So those curses that the witches are bringing are illegal. And now I stand here in the court of heaven enacting my judicial power, power of, of judicial decisions against these serpents, trampling them with that authority, crushing them with the cross, healing my soul with the blood and with fire. All the chaff is burned up. My soul is refreshed, nourished, and strengthened. And I'm delivered of these serpents right now by the power of your cross. And I receive the life-giving power of your flesh to regenerate my flesh, to push out that venom that's inside my body. I decree it right now in the name of Jesus as I partake of your body and your blood. Now let's take it together. I want to sing one song and then we're, it's already 12 so we have to go. So let's sing one time and as you do the fire is going to fall and you're going to get delivered. something big that we can sing about Jesus. Come up to the altar, please. Oh, man.
Father, as they come up, I decree right now all the trauma in their soul is being healed right now. I speak to every bit of trauma inside of them right now. Every place where you've been in pain right now, I release the power of the Spirit. I release the fire of God. I release the blood of Jesus to heal you of that pain, of that grief that you've had to endure, of the effects of the shipwreck right now. I decree right now an infilling in the name of Jesus of power, of light, of fire in the name of Jesus now. I thank you, Lord. Touch them and heal them right now. I command every root of trauma, I curse it. I command it to come out, every root of trauma in their mind, will, and emotions, everything they were thinking about, everything that has haunted them right now. I command them to be healed now in the name of Jesus right now. I thank you that a fire of God is gonna burn up every bit of chaff inside of them right now in the name of Jesus right now. In the name of Jesus right now. <laughs> 